Well, good evening, everybody uh, here from Finland. <clears throat> and we are, I think, on our 75th, I think so, um, our 75th meeting for the science of triangles. And uh, just to let you know about some things that are coming up, um, we're going to have a uh, a new moon meeting. Of course, here in Europe, it's really in the middle of the night. Uh, we'll let you know the exact timing, but it, it will be a Zoom uh, meditation that uh, Atui and I will be leading and a discussion uh, about Shambhala and the work of Shambhala at the present time, which is so, oh, uh, stressful and in a way uh, eliminative for humanity. Perhaps we can speculate on the role of Sanat Kumara and we intend uh, to unite to at some point here in the not too distant future, begin to work on that um, excellent um, compilation, which uh, Zach Rymill has pulled together of all the 700 and something references to Shambhala. And uh, we also want to do that in relation to the many references to Sirius. So it will be, oh, you know, one way or another, uh, an expansion of our offerings. And uh, maybe if I, I don't have to burden the communications team too much, I can learn how to do it myself without excessive number of mistakes. Anyway, it's an intention and I think it would be uh, useful. So somewhere around 1 a.m. GMT, maybe 1.30, I'm not sure I'll have to discuss it with Tuya. Um, we'll start this new moon program, uh, as I say, uh, meditation and discussion. And for, you know, if, if, if you're a real diehard in Europe, you'll be uh, awake and otherwise We'll have to rely upon uh, Vietnam and South America, and I think it won't be too bad for the United States. <clears throat> and Australia and New Zealand, they'll be good too. And then later that day, uh, we have our monthly meeting of the Esoteric United Nations. And if someone wants to join, you'll have a chance to make your commitment uh, that will be at 1 p.m. GMT. So it's going to be a big day, at least. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a big day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, meanwhile, we'll see what we do about triangles. Um, maybe simply the broadcast of triangles will go forth to you because it's not a discussion and it's as easy to broadcast it as it is to make another program for you to listen to. As far as the science of triangles goes, uh, I may have to make a uh, another program. So it, it'll be a very busy day. And then you can listen to the recording. And meanwhile, I want to welcome those of you who have joined us, Anne and uh, Ann Peterson and, and Ann Parker and Annette and Ario, Barbara, Brennan, uh, Britta, <clears throat> Catherine, Frederick, uh, Georgina, um, Jan, and Joan, and Johe, and Karen Gritska, Carrie, and Lona. Nice to see you again, Lona, Margo, um, Mariana, and Marina, Mariut, uh, Martin, and Miro, Risto, Sandra, Suzanne, and uh, Tia, Winnie, 
uh, Ivan and Zenaidi. And over here on the staff side, um, we will have uh, BL, Joe, and Michael uh, helping us uh, stay on track. And Tuya will be uh, joining us at some point here. So let's now actually what we're considering at the moment, uh, we won't be moving very far because we are uh, considering the ray triangles. Now, basically, what we have to realize is the difference between the signs of the zodiac and the constellations. The constellations DK calls um, galaxies of stars. The signs he calls concentrated uh, influences, which are, you know, particularly related to the Earth in a particular way. The constellations as a whole are related to um, all the planets in the solar system and also to our sun and every one of these constellations see here's a question is the constellation merely an asterism a collection of stars which appears to us in a certain configuration or is the constellation governed uh, as the expression governed by a superior entity known as the Lord of a constellation. Now, DK uses that term, uh, the Lord of the constellation Libra, a um, few others hinting that every collection of stars is ruled by a particular a constellational deity, which in a way we can call a um, constellational logos or a cosmic logos. And then there are a number of major and minor solar systems governed by solar logoi within this constellational uh, logos. So here's the thing. When we when we look at a constellation, um, and it has a certain configuration for us, what is the configuration when looked at, when it's being examined from a different point of space altogether? Is there one lord of a constellation, which collects all these different solar logo and has a certain quality? to it, for instance, we have something called the seven solar systems, of which ours is one. Just check out um, page 50 in the Esoteric Astrology book. And that whole constellation uh, of which our solar system is one has a particular magnetic quality that works through Taurus, the constellation Taurus, and the constellation Scorpio, and the planet uh, Mars. So do, it, does that stay as a constant, or according to a different point in space that the constellation is being observed, does it seem to have a different quality? I think, you know, we're not really in a position um, to answer that, but we do know, or we can reasonably conjecture, that every planet has its own series of signs connected with the Lord of a constellation. Now I'm sticking to our solar system for the moment. And every planet is in a different phase with respect to the orientation of its uh, vernal equinox. Some, some of the vernal equinoxes, like for instance, uh, 
in, in relation to Uranus are not pointing to the to our zodiac at all. So this is a form of, you know, kind of cosmic astrology. And, uh, you know, it would be good to get Nicholas Nilen in on this because he really knows how to use these um, uh, astronomical programs to illustrate these matters. Um, but it's a different time on each one of the planets of our solar system. And the question is, do the constellations mean the same thing to the planets in our solar system? I would say in general, they do, even though the time is different on each planet, according to the inclination of the axis, whether quite um, vertical, or tilted as ours is, or deeply tilted, the way Uranus axis uh, is, that will determine the equinoctial ages. And of course, uh, depending upon the time of the gyration of the, um, see, we, we have one complete gyration every 25,900 something years but it will be different for other planets with their particular gyration. We have something called a great platonic year. The great platonic year, DK rounds off to about 25,000 years. It's really a bit more, apparently. And uh, it's it, the duration of that great platonic year goes through all of the signs of the zodiac um, and right now we are uh, transferring from a great platonic year of uh, in pisces in a few hundred years or whenever he says your science cannot determine when but it's imminent we'll be transferring into a great platonic year ruled by aquarius in addition to a lesser equinoctial age. Now, our particular timing of, of how long a platonic year lasts and all that is different from that of other planets. It just depends on the gyration of their axis, like a top as it's spinning. So I'm not sure, you know, maybe somewhere these kinds of measurements have been uh, calculated. Probably if we went deeply enough into astronomy, we would find it is the case. So anyway, we're heading into an age of Aquarius Leo in a very, very large sense, a 25,000 year plus sense. We're also heading into a lesser age of Aquarius Leo, which the Tibetan says begins in the year 2117. But as far as what's going on on other planets, they have different constellations or signs emphasized. It can't all be uniform the way the Earth is. And uh, we would have to find out which age the different planets are going through. Maybe not Aquarius Leo at all, maybe something quite different. But that's going to be a very advanced type of uh, astrology. And, you know, one thing at a time. First of all, we have to learn how to uh, recognize the influence of the sacred planets and the hierarchical planets in our lives and on our planet. And then, of course, the larger constellations are greater beings, and we have to learn to recognize and, and utilize their influence as well. Now, you know, all of these um, constellations with their lords are part of a major head center, the 12 petaled lotus, the heart in the head of the one about whom naught may be said. 
that one about whom <clears throat> naught may be said usually is considered to be a super cosmic logos with constellations as the chakras. Now, I was just reading and refreshing that the, the centers in relation to the head are controlling the normal centers of the body. So they are very high beings. These lords of the zodiacal constellations are very high beings, and they have a big influence in our local supercosmic logos that we call the one about whom naught may be said. Now, and there are 49 of them, actually, in our sort of local galactic space, and maybe, maybe just in the arm, one of the arms of our galaxy. So all of this, you know, is even, um, the word is uh, recondite or abstruse, even to the masters themselves, this extension uh, of these entities. We have to simply deal at first with our own individual horoscope, the horoscope of our groups, and finally, <clears throat> the horoscope of humanity, um, and, you know, in which uh, Cancer and Pisces are so important, and Leo. And eventually, we will deal also with the uh, horoscope of the planet, but we can't even do that yet. And so these ray triangles turn out to be quite important. What we have to learn is why they should be associated with the particular ray that comes through them. Now, where are these rays coming from anyway? Well, you know, probably go to the top of the universe. You know, that's a funny, funny uh, expression. You know, go to the top of the universe. The, the the highest point in the pyramidal universe, and you probably got a septonate there, which is the prototype of all other lesser septonates, including the seven stars of the Big Dipper. Locally, we have seven stars of the Big Dipper. We have seven corresponding stars in the Little Bear, you know, Big Dipper, Great Bear, and also in the Little Bear. And then we have seven Pleiades that are major, at least for us, they're major. And so that's 21 in all, uh, giving us the sources of the rays for us. They come in uh, via their will nature from the Great Bear. They come in via their love nature from the little bear, and Sirius is considered to be a blind for the little bear. And then they come in via their intelligence nature from the Pleiades. So seven rays and a triplicity for each ray in terms of the point of origin. Now, basically, we we were able to cover a little bit about the um, triangle Aries, Leo, Capricorn, last time we talked. And, you know, you can review these programs on Makara and um, uh, also before long, I think, with uh, Joe and Harold working on it. Um, on, on YouTube. So there's a lot to listen to. There's a lot to think about. Uh, and a review is in order. Every time I think about these things, I'm finding new ways to think about them. Now, it's very interesting that for Ray 2, I don't know what GMR means. It looks, sounds like some kind of agricultural product. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can, yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
the the constellations, the lords of the constellations through which the second ray is transmitted um, are Gemini, Virgo, and Pisces. And immediately you look at them, and what do you see? You see they are all on the mutable cross, or it's called the common cross. Sagittarius, a majorly sixth ray sign or constellation, is not uh, listed here. It's listed in another mutable cross combination where Gemini is left out of the picture. And of course, there's got to be deeply occult reasons why these uh, opposites are changing place, but Virgo and Pisces uh, remain. So Gemini, Virgo, and Pisces will provide for you some access to the second ray when they are um, uh, in your horoscope in a prominent position. Sun sign, rising sign, moon sign, angle, or stellium, let us say. A stellium is a collection of several planets all in the same sign. And the stronger, the the closer the, the planets are to each other, the stronger is the uh, stellium. So these planet, these signs, let's call them signs now, we know they come from, the real energy comes from the constellation, okay? The signs are a Davic reflection that is especially attuned to the um, lords of those particular constellations, a Davic uh, reflection. So the interesting thing is that although Mercury uh, transmits the fourth ray and some others, because every planet has its own monadic ray, soul ray, personality ray, and probably a ray of a um, mind, emotions, and body, which are not emphasized in terms of planets. So, you know, we say Mercury fourth ray. It's the soul ray because it's a sacred planet. And uh, then comes Venus, fifth ray, esoterically. And then comes the Earth. And and this is interesting. Um, second ray, esoterically, but third ray, usually. Uh, because we still have a non-sacred planet here, and we are very much expressing our third ray uh, personality. So I, you know, my formatting is not good, and I, and I don't want to do too much attempt to format right now. Just try to take it in. The rulers are Mercury, fourth ray. Um, Venus, fifth ray, and Earth, third ray, but coming on to the second ray. Now, those are rays associated with the basic second ray coming through the constellation or sign Gemini. But th this is the point I want to make. That because Gemini is a second ray sign, that's the only ray he gives to us, that means that every one of those planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, even though they have their own ray, are also transmitters in some way that, you know, we would have yet to understand, transmitters of the second ray. Gemini has the major, a major second ray. And that means second ray does come through Mercury, in addition to its own fourth ray and third ray and fifth ray. Second ray comes through Mercury. Second ray comes through Venus and emphasizes the 
monadic second ray of Venus. And the second ray comes through the Earth, emphasizing the second ray soul of our planetary logos. Now, if, if you get into the book, The Destiny of the Nations, and you see how Master D.K. interprets the horoscope, well, or astrological chart of various prominent nations, you will see how many, many energies there really are that make um, a nation what it is. Not just its soul and personality ray, and not just its sign, uh, and uh, not just its sign and the ray that comes through the sign. No, there's more. There's the rays of the rulers of the sign, and then there's the ray coming through those rulers uh, in a way dominating or passing through their normal ray. Like if Mercury's fourth ray, which it is, you know, DK gives it, that big second ray is also coming through Mercury. If Venus's fifth ray, which it is, there's a big second ray coming through Venus because of the sign it's associated with. And our Earth, well, it's very interesting. Humanity is eventually supposed to have a second ray soul. Sagittarius, back in the good old days, was animal man. And we can see it. It's the centaur, half man and half beast, uh, half horse. And so Gemini was the angel. The angel got together with animal man and humanity was created. Well, the big second ray of Gemini is going to emphasize the eventual ray of humanity and also the soul of our planet. So here's my point. There are a lot of influences going on with anyone, within any one of these ray triangles. You, you can't just say, oh, there's Gemini's second ray. There's a lot more to it. Gemini Mercury, Gemini Venus, Gemini Earth. And then the second ray going through those planets and their rays and the many other rays that are connected with the planets. For instance, let's take Venus. If, if I'm going to look at what Venus probably is, I, I, I will know from what's been written that Venus is a second ray, sixth ray monad. Or maybe I should do it in the reverse manner. Sixth ray, second ray monad. It's a fifth ray soul, it's uh, probably a fourth ray or second ray personality. We're not really given the personality ray of the sacred planets. We have to figure it out ourselves. And probably it has a fourth ray mind, a second ray astral body, and a seventh ray physical body. All those rays count. Now, I may be wrong in my estimation, but if I'm wrong, I'm only partially wrong. I mean, I think, I think I, the speculation is mostly correct. Certainly monadically and in terms of the soul, it's not speculation. It is given that Venus is the home of the plant of the, uh, how does it say, the, uh, the home of the a sixth ray. And the home means that it is monadic. And the sixth ray has to turn into the second ray in terms of the major monadic ray of Venus. So what's the point? The point here is that there are a lot of rays. When you look at these ray triangles, there's a lot of rays and planets through which the major ray indicated is passing. Second ray, 
is the major ray indicated. Even the number two is right there with Gemini. And it is, of course, a, the third sign, so it has some connection num numerologically with the third ray. So that's the point. Just watch out for the many influences that come through these ray triangles and try to be aware of them. You should know the orthodox, that is exoteric, the esoteric, and the hierarchical ruler of each sign. You should know that. And that will make life easier when it comes to interpretation. Now, Gemini is the angel and is very associated with the solar angels and the work they do for humanity. However, Sagittarius is the bow and arrow by which the quality of the solar angel was shot into the higher mental plane on the third level and was able to uh, produce the causal body and anchor the angel of the presence, anchor the angel of the presence in the brain and mind of animal man. So we haven't gotten rid of good old Sagittarius. Uh, Gemini is also called the head of the cosmic Christ. Now, one of my friends uh, who's an excellent astrologer has um, a theory there that Orion is really the cosmic Christ, but he doesn't have a head. The hunter, in terms of the... Uh, the asterism, how Orion appears to us sort of as a great man in the sky, is headless. You just see shoulders. And Gemini is very close to Orion, uh, positionally, in space. So there's a connection there between Gemini providing a head function for um, the great giant, uh, Orion. Uh, Gemini has to be important in relation to the Hall of Learning. Now, you know, we all pass through the Hall of Ignorance, okay? And we're not aware that we have a higher self. We're not aware of a higher power. We're, we're just, maybe we say, oh, there's a God, big God, you know, and we're afraid of that God and we worship that God and all that. Um, but we're not aware that the God is within us and that there's a duality. So when we get into the um, love petals, we're into the hall of learning. And Gemini has its place there because it's only in the hall of learning that the higher self, the higher power, and the lower self begin to interact, and that the lower self becomes aware of the higher self until the polarization or the focus is transferred from the lower self into the higher self as we begin to take initiation. And then we're working on the sacrifice pedals, and the fifth pedal opens completely, and we've taken the first initiation. But Gemini is really important, and, and Gemini is so connected with learning anyway, isn't it? You go off to school. It's a Gemini thing, isn't it? And you read, and you write, and you, you, know, you communicate. So in the Hall of Learning, we have to think of this. Gemini coloration. Now, people like yourself and myself, we're not experts, but we're aware that there is a higher power. We're aware, even if we don't call it by its proper name, uh, we, we're aware that there is an angel of the presence. 
that it comes brighter and brighter and brighter as lives go on. I recognize my other self because I'm standing within my brightening higher part. And then I look down and I see what I thought I was before. I recognize my other self, which is the one I thought I was, and in the waning of that self, in other words, as it gets dimmer, I, the higher power, I, the higher self, grow and glow. So Gemini is so important in the whole science of relations. And, you know, if sometimes when I think about what's the science of all sciences, you know, DK says, yeah, it's, astrology is the, uh, the greatest and oldest of all the sciences. But I, I keep on thinking that there is something even more general. And I would call it the science of relations, how everything touches everything else and the effect that everything has on everything else. I call that learning that, the science of relations. Well, in general, Gemini is the sign that really links and brings together uh, into unifying relationship the great pairs of opposites. Gemini is the pair of opposites in a way, and it also creates a relationship between them. So you have kind of a, a, an antichronic loop that goes higher, lower, higher, lower, until they, you know, they're coming together, they're coming together. And you, you know the story that when you consider the opposites of Gemini and Sagittarius, then Pisces has to play that role of linking them together. Because, you know, Gemini cannot link itself if you have a Gemini Sagittarius opposition, Pisces links them. Now, the very first individual incarnation was taken with the sun in Pisces. In other words, when you, animal man, take your first incarnation as individualized animal man, um, Pisces is, is giving you that first incarnation. When humanity as a whole takes its first incarnation, then cancer is the sign, these water signs. Now, you see, different things come to you as you think about this. The love petals of the egoic lotus are ruled by water. Petal four, cancer. Petal five, Scorpio. Petal six, Pisces. And so these these water signs are connected with love also and with learning and with union, bringing together the pairs of opposites. So what we have to learn to do is really, if we want to meditate properly, if we want to see life more as it is, <clears throat> we can't just say, I have a higher self, we have to say and mean it because we experience it that I am that higher self. I am that higher power. It's a higher part of me. I don't mean that we are the solar angel, but we are certainly the ego, uh, higher ego on the higher mental plane. And then we're the spiritual triad too. We have to re-identify. And Gemini helps us do that. Now, think about the Alice Bailey work. So Alice Bailey, born with the son in Gemini. Mary Bailey, son in Gemini. Foster Bailey, Gemini rising. Here's Master Decay, the messenger of the hierarchy the sanctioned messenger of the hierarchy, powerful Gemini, as well as Taurus, I would say, for just the sheer light that he brings and the abundance of knowledge. 
So in making our planet a sacred planet and making humanity a sacred kingdom, whose soul is on the second ray and not on the fourth ray anymore, uh, Gemini, second ray Gemini is very, very important. Now, when we, you know, when we finish these, the analysis of these um, ray triangles, um, we're going to go into which particular sign is on the top of each triangle and why, which is dominant at the moment. And it's not Gemini, not at the moment. I can't tell you when Gemini would be dominant, but in the early days, it was really dominant because it allowed us to make the kingdom of humanity a reality. And when it comes to making the earth a sacred planet, you can be sure that Gemini will have a very big role uh, to play. We kind of know just the ABCs about these signs, but let's remember they are great entities. The, the constellations are ruled by constellational lords, much greater than solar logoi. And so they have many, many functions, which we cannot possibly yet understand. But a few hints, a few hints, take us closer and closer. When it comes to Virgo, there's more of the second ray that comes through Virgo than at this time, than through either Gemini or Pisces. More sort of usable, practical, uh, immediately applied second ray coming through Virgo. So Virgo is considered associated with two mantrams. It's a triple sign. It's one of the M signs. So matter is there. M for matter, mother. I am the mother and the child. So I am the third aspect and the second. I God, first aspect. I matter, third aspect, am. Virgo somehow combines all of these. But DK tells us that the real mantra for Virgo is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is that glory anyway? The first real glory is the transfiguration initiation where the personality is so purified that it really can reflect and radiate the light and love of the soul and the beginning of the experience of dealing with uh, God the Father. So this is the particularly the individual Christ. And we know when we're talking about Christ consciousness, we're talking about an example of consciousness which is deeply conditioned by the second ray of love and wisdom. Virgo has the practical mind and at the same time, rays two and six come through it. It is the redeemer of matter, which right now on our planet is very subject to the third ray and therefore responsive to the personality. Think of it, Gemini is the third sign and Virgo is a triple sign, an M, and it is connected with the matter uh, aspect, but it's also connected with uniting spirit and matter. And it's tremendously associated with the preparation for the birth of the Christ in the human heart or the birth of the second ray. And what does that birth of the second ray really mean? Many things, but it means that finally, we are responding to the hierarchy and we are responding not just to the personality 
of our planet, which is the third ray of creative intelligence, we are responding to the second ray love wisdom soul of the personality. Now, think about psychology for a minute. No, uh, se second ray soul. Okay, okay. Think, think about... Um, I'll think about what I was going to think about, but I've forgotten what I was going to think about. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, we have this long, long gestation period uh, physically, but much, much longer is the gestation period of consciousness whereby we are purifying, and remember purity is connected with the second ray, we're purifying every vehicle. What, what are the energies coming out of Shambhala? Um, purification is the second uh, energy coming out of Shambhala. There's also uh, destruction first aspect, and organization, third aspect. So when you purify, you are transmuting, you are transforming, and you're making it possible <clears throat> for the Christ consciousness to come in a purified vehicle. Destruction, first ray, purification, second ray, organization, third ray, and following down to the seventh. So Virgo is cleaning away, uh, dissolving away all of the dross, the impediments, the things that, uh, the dirt, if you will, the accumulations, which um, prevent us from really being souls walking the earth. So there's a lot of Virgo people who are very intelligent. They respond to the Mercury part, the early Mercury part. Then comes the Moon part, esoterically, which is a combination of Vulcan etheric physical and Neptune astral purification there. And when you finally get to Aquarius, it's a triple purification. But I can say that Virgo helps to purify the mind by rendering it logical. And therefore, again, through these rulers, in some way that, well, you know, we have yet to understand, here's the second ray of Virgo coming through Mercury again, even though Mercury is a fourth ray planet. Here's the sec uh, second ray of Virgo coming through the moon, even though the moon has no real radiation of its own and is veiling Vulcan and Neptune. And that means that the second ray is coming through the veiled planets, Vulcan and Neptune, even though they have their own rays. And finally, Virgo is representing the fulfilled individual Christ consciousness uh, through Jupiter, the hierarchical ruler, which is also a second ray planet. And so Virgo and Jupiter together uh, represent uh, the handling of all kinds of material detail in the spirit of love and wisdom. So what am I saying? That look at the look at the rulers of every one of these signs and realize that in addition to the ray which these rulers have, Mercury, Moon veiling Vulcan, Neptune, and Jupiter, that the great second ray is going to come through those planets also. So that's, you know, looking for deeper and deeper layers do you have access to all the rays? You really do. Through the planets, access to all the rays. You have all of the planets. And 
sometimes it's an easier access than others. If a planet is right there on your midheaven, right on your ascendant, if it's conjunct your sun or your moon or whatever, there's an easy access to a particular ray energy. Uh, and you just have to look at your, your astrological chart and say, I can access all the rays, but what is it given to me to do in this incarnation, uh, which is most important, and what ray or combination of rays do I have to access astrologically in order to fulfill my dharma? And all of that is, uh, is another layer in addition simply to your ray chart. So I often look at it this way. In the left hand is everything astrological, and in the right hand is everything rayological. And you mix and you blend them together. And the more you know about the qualities, uh, the more you'll be able to access and select and utilize what you've been given in your horoscope. And, you know, you will progress in uh, understanding and in service in general. Finally, we come to Pisces, which in a way is the most powerful second ray sign. It's very interesting that uh, the whole zodiac begins <clears throat> with the most powerful first ray sign, Aries and goes all the way around in the natural order, which is counterclockwise, and ends with the great second ray sign, Pisces, which is a cosmic decanate. We've been kind of talking about those a little bit, and it's an obscure matter, I, I admit it. But we've been talking about the importance of Pisces in relation to the Christ the great Christ energy, the consummating Christ energy, the kind of Christ energy that leads us at the fifth initiation into Shambhala, because we really can say, we really can acquiesce and say, not my will, but thine be done, Father. Father, not my will, but thine be done, as the Christ did, using the acquiescent Pisces energy. Uh, it begins with a lot of glamour and a lot of distortion. And the theme is <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, the theme is go forth into matter and then become completely bewildered and glamoured and susceptible and led astray and uh, basically vulnerable to all the forces which one cannot control. But eventually, the sensitivity of Pisces grows so greatly. Now remember, Sirius, a local cosmic Christ, is the brilliant star of sensitivity. And Pisces is ruled, yes, by Jupiter and Pluto, but a great and general ruler for Pisces, uh, as far as humanity is concerned, is Neptune. Neptune has a second ray monad, page 420 and 421 in Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1. It's kind of all those tabulations in the back of the book. And this is a second-ray solar system. This is a major second-ray solar system. And the monadic ray of uh, Pisces is very, very important, of, of Neptune, rather, is very, very important for um, this solar system. Now, you know, speaking of rays, it would be hard to determine, but you've got to suspect that every zodiacal constellation has a triangle. 
a monadic ray, a sole or triadal ray, and a personal ray. Now, as far as figuring that out, <laughs> it would have to be sheer speculation. But my guess would be that for Pisces, on the monadic, cosmic monadic level, you know, just words, but okay, cosmic monadic level, it would be the great second ray. So basically what happens with Pisces eventually is that it dissolves all illusions and glamours. And its uh, rulership by Neptune, as far as humanity is concerned, helps in this prolaic process. When everything is over, love wisdom reigns. Now, let's you know stay away from the entirety of the universe. We're, we're right down here in our local cosmos system. And our universe, uh, our local universe, which is the solar system, and also the cosmic logoi, which are solar systems. Everything is a solar system. It just depends on how limited, you know. Even a cosmic uh, logos, the one about whom not may be said, super cosmic logos, is a system of stars or a system of constellations, which are a system of stars. So in a way, it's a solar system, okay? But Pisces will be instrumental uh, in with Neptune in uh, this time in helping to dissolve this major second ray solar system in which we find ourselves. Now, probably the first ray constellations will be very important in the next solar system, and the previous solar major solar system, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn, as constellations were very important. So Pisces is a much more universal kind of Christ than Virgo. Uh, it's sort of uh, Aries Pisces is a kind of cosmic Christ on the constellational level. <clears throat> and that's what uh, DK tells us. Virgo, the individual Christ, Aries, the cosmic Christ, and when it, when we look at Pisces, and it's a, a, a cosmic decanate on the second ray, we've got to say it is associated with the cosmic Christ. What is the cosmic Christ? Any series of entities, greater and greater and greater, who are associated with the great love wisdom aspect sirius is a kind of cosmic christ the syrian grouping orion we're speculating also is connected with the cosmic christ um our particular one about whom not may be said has a cosmic buddhic i think soul you know, if you turn, I think the page is 1162, you get the idea that cosmic booty, uh, the kind of booty from the cosmic buddhic plane, is a super type of cosmic Christ as far as we're concerned. And you could go on. Probably there are galaxies ruled by galactic lords who are on the second aspect, and they would be still greater kinds of cosmic Christs. Ultimately, we're just putting it in our own terms, of course. Christ, you know, our own terms. We go to the top of the universe again, and we'd find the great second aspect in some form, some archetypal form, and it would be the universal cosmic Christ on the, using the second aspect, way beyond what we call rays, but at least the second part of a great septonate. Okay, Gemini, Virgo, Pisces. Pisces is ruled by Jupiter, 
Pluto, Pluto, and finally Neptune in a large way. And Jupiter is a second ray soul. Pluto, we don't know the soul ray. We probably know the personality ray, ray one. Maybe Pluto has something connected with third ray or sixth ray. And Neptune, a six ray soul. And through those planets, again, comes the second ray that travels through Pisces, transmitted through Pisces, and goes through all of those planets. I admit it's a weird thought, but somehow this second ray of love wisdom that is coming transmitted through Pisces is also reaching us through Pluto because it's one of the rulers. Now, Pluto is a great healer. But Pluto is the healer with the power of the serpent. It has a lot of Kundalini third ray and it's, it rules the realm of Hades, which is the astral plane sixth ray. And of course, it has the destructive first ray, but somehow the second ray is going to permeate and come through Pluto also. And as far as Jupiter and Neptune go, they have so much second ray that the Pisces second ray just emphasizes them. So just think for a moment. Do you have in your chart any of these in prominent positions, or do you have more than one? Um, you know, for instance, just kind of off the top of my head, if you have, um, let's say Jupiter and Gemini, it's a big second ray indicator. If you have, along with that, the moon in Pisces, if you have, along with that, a stellium in Virgo, that is a rulership stellium, then you've definitely provided astrologically for the entry of the great second ray, even though it may not be exactly in your ray chart. So there's a lot of places the rays can come from, direct and indirect. They can be in your ray chart, but they can also be coming through your astrological rulerships in various ways. So, you know, tune in uh, with me when I do some reading in the Destiny of the Nations. And I've done, I've finished the United States now. Well, I, you know, you can't really say that, but in the, I have um, worked on the energies of the United States and I'm now working when I do it, which is not always, um, on the energies of the United Kingdom. And just see how DK uses all of these variety of influences. And then you can apply them to your individual horoscope interpretation. You will find that you will have access to all the rays, but some more intensely than others. And some of the rays are your dharma for this particular incarnation. And others are not so emphasized. You have to figure out, though, and it's, you know, in a way, it's quite simple. There are two triangles you have to work with. You have to rely upon the best parts of your moon position and not get stuck in that rotary prison of the past. You have to utilize consciously as a integrating personality, your sun sign, and you have to move towards your soul, towards the center of your soul life with your rising sign. And if you happen to be the type of person, 
for whom the monad means something practical, then you're going to look at that triangle of sun, rising sign, and the point opposite the rising sign, which will indicate a monadic open door for this particular incarnation. It'll keep changing because, uh, you know, the monad can use all the different rays. And, you know, if, let's say, if I'm an Aries type in my sun and I have Libra as the point opposite, then that third ray Libran quality will be useful for me monadically if I am at that stage where I can utilize it. And suppose I had a third ray monad, it would reinforce or be reinforced by the Libra third ray energy. So, you know, everybody's unique. And we are a lot more than the astrology of a particular incarnation. We've been doing it for a long time. And our whole person, our whole causal body is built up of many horoscopes, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of horoscopes that we've had, and we've been building the causal body uh, accordingly. So we're much more than just our present rays and our present um, uh, astrology, but we can utilize uh, the many, many energy factors to which we have access in order to improve the Dharma, the direction in which we are supposed to be traveling. So, you know, um, here we're going, going in depth a little bit. And um, I'm going to just say, you know, obviously we're still on the same page. We just uh, basically um, finished number 75. And it's 489. We're still there. And our date today, uh -huh, that should have been 5th August. Okay. That was wrong. By the way, happy birthday, uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatskaya, today. Madame Blavatsky's birthday, today. And uh, tomorrow, the 33rd anniversary of the founding of the University of the Seven Rays. So, you know, we are right in there with HPB. <laughs> But uh, it's our anniversary, 33, I think, is significant. And uh, so this is 12 of August, and we're ending here. And then we'll start next time. We'll look at the third ray triangle. And it'll be 489 again, and it will be, well, I'm just not sure how we're going to do this. It may be that I have to make a recording for you because we've got so much going on on the 19th of August <clears throat> where we'll try to have kind of a Shambhala meeting and a esoteric United Nations meeting. And maybe later we'll see, do we have a triangles, ordinary triangles meeting? And it might be just breaking the camel's back to have esoteric uh, <clears throat> triangles on that day. So we'll just, we'll just see. And we'll we'll get back to you on that. So this is morning, but don't take it too seriously. Uh, let's just say we'll call it uh, subject uh, to postponement <laughs> and modification because there may not be anything left of us if we try to do too much uh, whoop, on that day. Okay. Okay, presentation, there we go. Subject to postponement or modification. <clears throat> All right.
right, we've looked at the second ray triangle on the mutable cross, and we're ready. If there's some discussion, questions, um, this is the time for it. I, I, Michael. I, yes, Michael. Devon has raised her hand. Okay. Okay. And Yvonne, you are self-muted. There you go. Please go ahead. Okay, Michael. Uh, we're one of seven solar systems, and this is the configuration, Ray 2, uh, uh, you know, our solar logos. But the other six solar systems and their solar logos, are they doing the same thing we are? Are they on the same schedule? Are they working on the same rays? Or do they have different ray configurations? And after these seven solar systems are done, who, who's who about not maybe said, is he the one, the cosmic one, who's in charge of the seven solar systems? I mean, I, yeah. I'm confused sometimes who I'm praying to, who the head honcho is. I think the planetary logos is good enough. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, here is here here are these uh, page fifty. Magnetic energy coming from the seven solar systems of uh, it's an esoteric um, uh, astrology. Now um, on page two, okay. So here's the seven solar systems of which ours is one. And uh, I don't have the alignment proper here, but uh, Taurus, Scorpio, and Mars are the way that these seven solar systems work. Are they a sacral center or a solar plexus center? I think I've been assuming that the seven solar systems taken together are what you call a cosmic logos. And I think it's a solar plexus in the one about whom naught may be said. And the whole issue there is desire. So the, from the cosmic logoic point of view, I think that great being, along with uh, our star and, the, let's see, the the star, uh, let's see, Altair, Procyon, uh, Sirius, um, Alpha and Beta Centauri, um, maybe Vega. Those, I think, are some of the other prominent solar logoi in these seven solar systems. So it's, it's way, way beyond us to to think about, well, we can think about it, but in terms of this cosmic logos that in, includes our solar logos as a chakra, it's just something to know. It's not anything that we can really contact. I don't think, uh, I don't think the masters can really contact that either, <clears throat> except maybe at the very highest initiations for them. I'll show you this page that is uh, good when it comes to that, Yvonne. This is from a treatise on Cosmic Fire, and it's page 293, I think. And there it is. A solar logos has, has planetary logo, or heavenly men for its chakras. A cosmic logos has solar logoi for its chakras. And the unknown that we want to call, there's lots of unknowns, okay? But the first unknown that we're dealing with here is our one about whom not may be said, and it has constellations or cosmic logoi for its chakras. Now, you know, if... Um, if we got a hold of that uh, Starry Night program and, you know, started to move around with that. Um, but I think I just better leave that to Nicholas. He's the expert there. 
we could we could see some of these different orders of beings. Now, the the to be practical about this, in terms of our prayers and our meditations, <clears throat> they have to be directed uh, first to the ashram with which we think we are becoming associated. Then in general, they have to be directed to the Christ and his masters in general that we are uh, trying to assist in our own little way. And then we can open ourselves to the uh, descent of divine purpose coming from Sanat Kumara, realizing that that kind of purpose is, is rather far beyond us to understand, but at least we can say, okay, let my life be purposeful in terms of the manifestation of the divine plan. We're, what we are, we're not praying to the universal God or meditating with the idea that we can somehow communicate with those extraordinarily high levels. We're, we're pretty much keeping it within our planet, I would say. And to be aware that God is love, meaning the solar logos is love, and we're all little units of love. And our, our, our God, the solar logos, is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire, the consuming fire of love. I'd say that's as far as we can go. Hey, Michael, I wasn't serious about when I said I'd who to pray with. I have enough <laughs> trouble getting to the spiritual hierarchy, the spiritual triad when I'm praying. That's fine. But this, this answers my question. I was wondering the pecking order. You know, oh, I know yeah, that yeah, that's, 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 I'm, I'm just trying to get to the spiritual triad at this point. So, But yeah. I appreciate that. This is interesting. Thank you. Well, I tell you, Yvonne, the, the, the way to do that, as we all know, is to um, follow the Tibetans 100 page instructions on building and using the Antikarana and using the word of power on our soul ray. You, you know those, I assert the fact, Ray one. Um, I see the greatest light, ray two. Purpose itself am I, ray three. Two merge with one, ray four, soul. Uh, three minds unite, ray five. Uh, the highest light controls, ray six. And the highest and the lowest meet, ray seven. So when you use those words of power, according to your soul ray, you gradually build your way into that impersonal sphere we call the spiritual triad, which is actually our true soul outside of the vehicle that we call the causal body. That, that, so that's, that's the way to do it. And of course, both meditation and prayer are useful. It just depends on the circumstance. You, you wouldn't want to abandon either either one of those, especially if the motive is a, a selfless one, a service motive, a, a helpful a helpful motive. So I, I've been presenting a very big picture here, you know, basically, um, like this thing is really big, and uh, you can see how tiny we are, but the whole. The whole map here is, is tiny anyway, compared to a galaxy. So that helps to expand the mind and just tell us that there are just um, billions and billions and billions of years remaining uh, in this universe. And we're in for a great adventure on the way of higher evolution when we can uh, uh, fulfill the initiatory requirements. And maybe one of the first things is we have to learn how to work together uh, in group uh, formation. Now, DK, you know, that, that's Aquarius, and that's what DK was really 
trying to train people to do because they're more effective in service when we have these uh, right, rightly functioning service groups. So with a map like this, I would just get inspired by it and then realize there's a lot of things much closer to home that I have to take care of in order to really enter uh, this map uh, ascending, you know, the way the Christ has ascended. Big. Thank you. That, that satisfied my mental body. I have another practical question. When I'm doing the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, who am I really praying to? My monad, uh, the planetary logos, yeah. who's our Did Father in heaven? That? Did you find that in the, um, on the CD-ROM? Because there's a whole explanation. Okay, I'll look for it. Yeah, but, but basically, um, well, okay, you know, basically... It is Shambhala that you are orienting okay. yourself towards, and the and and the monad is included within Shambhala. But he does give a very interesting interpretation. I, I wish I could remember everything there, but he goes line by line with the Lord's Prayer. Okay, and see, I have it. Yeah, see Thank what you, you think. See Thank what you, you think. Read it and. Um, um, it may even be as far as the solar logos. Uh, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's, you know, it's invoking the, um, the heavenly will. It's invoking the law of karma. Uh, it's invoking the idea of uh, forgiveness. And then um, it's helping us overcome the temptations in the desert after the second initiation. We all have to go into the desert, symbolically speaking, and face the demands of the personality and have, have to overcome them. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. And then it reasserts um, the glory of the planetary logos and the glory of the solar god. When I read it, I said, boy, this is really an interesting way of uh, dealing with the Lord's Prayer. Um, so, so, and basically, look, you know, our whole job is to become the higher self, which we already are. You know, in other words, we are those higher things, and we have consciously uh, to realize that we are those higher aspects of ourselves that that's called identification and that's really uh, ultimately important uh, the christ had it down he had it nailed you know and uh, and what was it the uh, 17th chapter of john was it where dk said read this this is the best statement on identification ever so, so there is uh, prayer, there is meditation, and then there is identification, like three steps. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Okay, Michael, we have a question from Vicki. Could you please walk me through why you consider this the fifth solar system, second major system, and not the sixth? Thank you. I have heard you say this several times in Adventures in Esoteric Astrology. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, what I think I know about it is that there was a, for our solar logos, uh, an incarnation that was strictly etheric physical just the way Lemuria was for, uh, for, for animal man, newly individualized. Then there was a uh, correspondence to a, an Atlantean civilization, um, which was emotionally uh, focused. And that must have been really something because we do have a sort of logos that has a tremendous emotional focus at this time. Then came the lower mental aspect for the third solar system. None of these would 
be sacred solar systems yet. And the development of the mind would be there, but the next solar system would combine the first three aspects, etheric, physical, astral, and lower mental, into a personal mental solar system. That would be the first sacred solar system. It's really the fourth, but it's the previous solar system and its color is green. What's very interesting in terms of music is that the fourth or the sub subdominant is a green note, the note F if we start on the note C. So we start, you know, on a red note and uh, proceed. Um, that's the F note. That's the green note. That is the note Fa. That is the note of the previous sacred, or should we say uh, major, let's call it major solar system. But that solar system dissolved, was destroyed, went into Perlaya, still hangs around, according to cosmic fire, as a cosmic moon, which has the same backward pulling effect on the whole solar system our present solar system, as the moon has on our Earth. So it's a negative influence. The dissolution of solar system four, which was the first major, Fa, green, F, solar system, is causing trouble in this solar system. Then we move on to the second major solar system in which initiations can be taken along the cosmic line by the solar logos. It's the fifth in order, but it's the second major. And its note is G. And it's the blue solar system. And hence, we have the name of our logos, solar logos at this time, the blue logos. So it's five in a row, but second major, if you see how I'm counting. Now, the next solar system coming will be the sixth. It will be a kind of red solar system. It will be focused on the first ray. Probably what will happen is the personality ray <clears throat> of the solar logos will be the first for that sixth solar system, which if we count in the manner I am counting, is the third major. It'll have a whole different set of rules Individualization will be very different. It will involve the monadic plane. And we as solar angels, some of us, the bulk of humanity, will probably be returning to that solar system to assist. Or maybe, you know, later in this solar system, I don't know. But Earth will undergo a different incarnation. Earth being the base of the spine chakra of the solar logos will really emphasize its first ray monad in the sixth solar system in a row, which is the third major solar system and has not yet occurred. The seventh solar system is beyond time and space and is the summary of all six together considered as the seventh. Now, how that will work, I, I couldn't tell you, but <clears throat> he tells us there will be a seventh solar system, but it will not be a tangible system. It will have something to do with the numerological method 
of taking 21 and making it into 22, of taking 6 and making it into 7. We always add 1 for the entirety of having 11 qualities of the petals of the heart center and making it into 12 by summarizing the 11 as the final one. So it's a principle he uses all the time. The final one is the summation of all that has gone before. That's the way I've been counting. Therefore, we are in solar system number five in a row. And the second major solar system, a love wisdom system in which the color blue, maybe more like indigo, is the chief color when compared to green. And the big job now on our planet, which is a 2-3 in terms of soul and personality, and in the solar system, which is a 2-3, is to have the blue indigo ray overcome the green ray, which still has a lot of hangover from the past. That's how I see it. <clears throat> okay, is there anything okay. else? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to go back to Yvonne's thing about um, the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I, I found this in my first year of uh, study with the Moria Federation and, and put it in one of my papers. Um, it's dividing the formula uh, first, an invocation to the Solar Lord, uh, which is our Father which art in heaven, and then the seven keys for the dissipation of illusion, mm -hmm. being hallowed be thy name, we call it calling in the sacred light of our higher self, thy kingdom come, recognizing that each of us in uh, on the path we have returned to spirit, and we will we will arrive in no oneness with spirit. Uh, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, as above, so below. The will of the one life is manifest throughout existence. Give us this day our daily bread. As we sow, shall we also reap. Therefore, think and sow wisely. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we have not yet manifested perfection and therefore make mistakes, we must realize and accept the same in others. Lead us not into temptation. Help us as we tread the path of return so that we can see clearly and make correct and appropriate choices. Uh, seven, deliver us from evil. Through the efforts of ourselves and our companions on the path, we can overcome the separative thought of the lower mind and then end with the affirmation of divinity for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever hmm. and there there can be other interpretations no, that's good that's, that's, I, that's very good yeah that's what you wrote at the time did you and it yes yeah it's very good yeah um so and and what book was that in do you recall uh, i think it was in glamour um uh -huh. but, you know this was the first uh, long research paper I wrote, uh, specifically dealing with glamour. Okay, uh, let's just let's just try to our father, which art, or is it who art, who art, our father who? Well, you know, sometimes they don't. Page twenty-four. Uh huh. 24 of Glamour? Of Glamour? Yes. And it spills over to 25. Okay. Page 24 in Glamour. Okay. Hold on. So that means we would, we would have studied that together um, in the Glamour group. Um... 24 in Glamour World Problem. Ah, uh, here it is. Right, there it is. Good. Okay. So it, it really does seem 
well, you know, the solar lord, this could be the solar logos, or it could be the angel of the presence as a kind of representative of the solar lord, the solar angel. So we'll have to see. Yeah. And and we'll have to put this together with the seven uh, other modes of dissipating or um, dispelling illusion, the seven illusions he deals with. All right, this, um, yeah. Well, this is where to go then for the study. It has many meanings and the trite, and usual Christian significance is not for you. Ponder on this most ancient formula of truth and interpret it entirely in terms of a formula for the dissipation of illusion. And then you have to write the exegesis upon it. <laughs> Quite a uh, demanding project. And it gives us seven keys to the secret of the elimination of glamour. So somehow he's bringing illusion and glamour pretty close. It's not really a prayer, it's a formula. And when it comes to the solar lord, is it our solar logos? Could very well be. So that kind of Ivan gives you an idea, you know, about when we're praying, to whom and to what do we pray? So there is one possibility. Okay. And are there any other references to it? Our Father, does it say which art in heaven or who art in heaven? Does anybody, I think it's both, isn't it? depending on what version you use. It, it seems to be used both ways. But I I use ART, and you see, in the Alice Bailey books, they miss this all the time. They, they, they don't take the um, early language and use it. it. They say, thou has, instead of thou hast. And here they're saying, who are in heaven instead of who art. So, you know, someone doing the editing didn't know that. Um, and this is mostly Alice Bailey writing uh, in the uh, Christian mode in From Bethlehem to Calvary. So that particular uh, formula is only appearing here in her uh, unfinished autobiography, and what's the other one? Let's see. From Bethlehem. Michael. To yeah, yeah. Go ahead. My, yeah. He mentions the Lord Prayer in a number of books, but he mentions it in passing as he's comparing it to the Great Invocation, and um, the way that it's used. I, I think in. Um, maybe it's the reappearance of the Christ. He talks about the Lord's Prayer for the Christians, um, the 23rd Psalm for the Jewish, and uh, the Great Invocation for the New. Um, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, that, that, that's helpful. He doesn't, though, break it down any further than we saw on page 24. Is that correct? He doesn't. Um, as far as what I could find, no. Um, I had the same problem you had trying to search for the exact words because, as you say, depending on which version you're looking at, you get the archaic uh, phrasing versus the modern phrasing, and it doesn't correlate that well. But um, I, I'm with Michael. I think the glamour uh, book is the one that has That's the main one. The, you know, the seven keys to it. And then there are other references, of course, to the Lord's Prayer, but it's um, just in connection with yeah. um, uh, the, the great invocation and yeah. other prayers like it. So. I see that. Yeah. It's here. The new invocation, if given widespread distribution, can be to the New World Religion 
What the Lord's Prayer has been to Christianity and the 23rd Psalm has been to the spiritually minded Jew. And, um, and there are three approaches to this prayer. Um, now let's see. Or invocation. And that's the great invocation he's talking about. So not the Lord's Prayer. So it looks like the only place where he really uh, breaks it down in terms of the phraseology is the one that um, has been pointed to in Glamour. Yeah, okay. Yep. Uh, okay. okay, moving on to a question from Chris. Yep. Could you remind us what a heavenly man is? Yeah, in general, yes. Some people like to distinguish it from a planetary logos, but basically it is used interchangeably for planetary logos and sometimes for the soul nature of the planetary logos. I know uh, Peter Kubaska, who's done a lot of study on these things, uh, thinks that the heavenly man is the soul nature of a planetary logos. Uh, it may be. I, I have personally found so many references where planetary logos and heavenly man are basically uh, equivalent terms. So I don't know whether we have a compilation on heavenly man. How many, um, or heavenly men, how many would there be? Probably quite a few references, I suppose. Heavenly man. Whoa, 287 references. And heavenly men, 157 references. So obviously, um, I think he's simply talking about the, the great spirit that rules a planet in general. But um, Peter seems to think that if you look deeply enough, you'll find places where he is discriminating between a planetary logos as the monadic aspect of that logos and the heavenly man as the soul nature of that logos. I, I couldn't come down with anything definitive on that, but this looks like a compilation that needs to be done and the important um, references extracted. Not all of them will be equally important, of course. And let me just try to look here for something. I, I just want to see in my own uh, collection of uh, AAB extracts um, if uh, heavenly man. How many are there? Um, Chains are as chakras to a heavenly man. Okay, um, so that we have somewhat known. And it's in the compilation on Manu and Manus. Let's see where else. Um, cycles, egoic and personality cycles for the heavenly man and the soul of Logos. Let's see what that one looks like. Uh, the egoic cycles proceed in groups of sevens and threes and not in groups of fours and sevens, as do the personality cycles. And the same ratio must be pre predicated of the central cycles of a heavenly man or of a solar logos. So there the implication is the heavenly men are planetary logoi. Um, let's see if there's anything else here that stands out. In general, I think you're not going to go wrong if you consider them to be planetary logoi. And if there are sharper distinctions to be made, it would be a particular aspect of the planetary logos. The grand heavenly man 
is the solar logos. And it says here, the personality of the solar logos. Oh, here and here, gosh, here's a bunch of them. So I can't really get into it, but um, gosh, uh, BL, where, where, where are the AAB extracts to be found? On the compilation page, there. Um, if you go to Macar.us, you'll see the compilations there at the top. I'll put the link in here. But um, on the side panel, yeah, um, to the right hand side is where you'll find the AAB extracts, which is a zipped file that they can download, and then they can. Uh, once they unzip it, they can look at all those heavenly mm, things heavenly that you've got. Heavenly, yeah. I've got quite a few here, but but as long as you can access this yourself, according to BL's instructions, then uh, you should be able to find out. The hermaphrodite, divine hermaphrodite, is the heavenly man. And they evolve in a parallel manner to the solar logos, that is, to the grand heavenly man and the heavenly men that, you know, as planetary logoi developed to their present level in an earlier Mahamanvantara, which is an earlier solar system. It doesn't tell us which, but I suppose the previous uh, major solar system. Heavenly men are the lives expressing through the human kingdom system. Okay, so, uh, uh, and the heavenly man of earth, raise one, two, three, so that would be the planetary logos. Um, and the heavenly man is not the logoic heart center, but the embodied force of it. Anyway, to be studied. Uh, and... Uh, I think everything that I've got right here should be available according to BL's directions. And you can just check out the references one after another. They're not long, you know. And the thing you'll be looking for, heavenly men are cosmic entities. And so are planetary logoi. So that's okay. Who ensouls the seven solar systems down through the Lord of a solar system? Through the cosmic entities we call the heavenly men and the solar entities and souling groups. So the planetary logoi are cosmic entities and they are also called heavenly men. I think you can't go wrong with that general equivalence. However, there may be some specialized use of the term, and heavenly men may represent some different uh, strata, we might say, of these greater entities. Page 844, I wonder, in Cosmic Fire, how far that one goes. Let's, let's just try that. Is that Cosmic Fire? What is it? A telepathy? Uh, here it is. Okay, let's just see something. It may not go high enough. The planetary logo. Planetary logoi. Okay, it doesn't mention heavenly men, but um, I, I think they belong there. I think they belong there. And every once in a while, you get a term like manvantara which means like a period between two Manus. And it's an indefinite term. So sometimes Manvantara means an entire round and sometimes something much less or more. And I think if you look at the term heavenly man, it will be mostly planetary logoi, but sometimes it is assigned to a great being who is not a planetary logos. I think we have to study the compilation. Okay.
Okay, Michael, we could go on for a duration, but perhaps this should be the last question of. Uh, are there, are there, are there more? How many questions remain? There's one more that that's okay, written okay, okay, and no other okay, hands raised. Okay, okay. Uh, Suzanne writes, as to changing the sacred word, what are your thoughts on changes made to the great invocation by some esoteric groups? Well, I think you can understand um, why they would do that um, for the uh, purpose of appeal in a time when the uh, issue of uh, sexism, you know, uh, is so strong. Um, I, I prefer to stay with the original. I think that the original will have maybe a, um, a greater appeal to the Christian population, as it does mention the Christ per se. And when you start in with the coming one, a lot of research may be required, and people may simply reject it and say, no, no, I serve the Christ. I'm not interested in the coming one. Maybe other people will get more deeply into the meaning of it and be able to use it. Um, John Burgess, um, he, he uh, was associated with our work uh, some time ago. He's, he's passed on now. He did um, a numerological analysis of the great invocation as given. I don't know where his book can be obtained, but it is worth um, investigating because he found many things numerologically which would um, disappear with uh, changes, especially wide changes uh, to the great invocation. So, uh, I'm going to hold fast um, on the version that DK gave to Alice Bailey, but at the same time, DK did say that um, when you're talking to Christian audiences, you may want to use the word master instead of masters. So he showed that he was not uh, completely against uh, some modifications. Uh, I, I'm sure that the the new version that is circulating uh, can be used with uh, good effect, but I find power in the original. And so that's, I will stay with that uh, in my classes and uh, in, in the general work of the uh, university. Uh, and, and the Moria Federation. Okay, is that it then? That is it. Okay. Oh, yes, we're, we're right at that point. Okay, so let's, um, actually, you've taken us to the point where <laughs> we're going to say the great invocation, aren't we? So, um, and here we are. I think, you know, um, we have a big issue about the, it, it is more sophisticated, of course, to research what is the coming one and to realize that in a number of different religions, they look forward to a coming one. And then you have to do all this convincing that the coming one uh, is Lord Maitreya that the Christian world calls the Christ. Uh, it's opening the door to a considerable battle in my in my mind. And, uh, you know, for the time being, uh, we'll be sticking with this one. Okay. From the point of light within the mind of God, 
Let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. <clears throat> let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. Oh. I want to say uh, one more thing. Uh, tomorrow morning, reappearance of the Christ, you know, normal broadcast. We're, you know, trying to be somewhat normal for the rest of the week here. The occult truth has to do with man as manus. And working with the original, it invites us to explain to people some of these tenets of foundational occultism about the basic quality of man, which is at first menace and why it should be, why the term man is not a sexist term. And then, of course, it'll take us to the Deva kingdom, the great feminine kingdom, and at this time, humanity, the great masculine kingdom. And so it will open the door to certain explanations, which I think can be useful to people uh, if they think about those explanations. So, thank you for being here, and uh, we'll continue through the week, and uh, we have a, a big week coming up after that, so lots of love to everybody, and many blessings, and uh, Tui and I are working here, and the whole communications team is working hard at work, present uh, here, uh, uh, BL and Joe and Michael and there are others too um, helping to bring you these programs oftentimes sacrificing hours of sleep as <laughs> we are encouraged to do to forego peace to forfeit rest and in the stress of pain to lose myself and find myself thus entering into peace so the that 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 great mantra is really important, and it's the very beginning. Uh, you know, you get into the arcane school, and that you're presented with that mantra, uh, and it carries through for the rest of your occult studies. So, we'll be seeing you then, and um, tomorrow morning, simply a broadcast.
with some readings from the reappearance of the Christ. And uh, let's carry on and keep moving, uh, keep moving forward. All the best. Lots of love. See you then. Bye-bye.